Listen, I pulled these out last night. I was reading them, and you know, these are, these are prophetic words that have been spoken over this church, over some of them over my wife and I. And, and I don't know if these are out there. I'll make sure they're out there uh, between now and next week. But I, but I kind of I summed it up. I, you know, there's lots of them that have been spoken. I think there have been more words spoken over this church over the last couple of years, uh, maybe three, four years, than the previous 30 years combined. It, it's like these, these people were coming out of the word work saying, God spoke to me and said to tell you. Or they were here speaking and all of a sudden they stopped everything and they said, this is what the Spirit of the Lord would say over you and over this house. And, and I just sat there and I thought, God, where have you been all this time? And it's not where have you been all this time, God, it's where was I all this time? Because God is speaking, God is moving, are we hearing, are we listening? Are we seeing, are we pressing in? He's speaking, he's moving all of the time. But anyway, you know, I summed it up on this one sheet. It says, grace is a healing place. We've received that word. A triage center. There's a breaker anointing on our worship. There is a release of supernatural faith. The lid is taken off dreams. New hope, new vision, new transformation ideas, wisdom, strategy, courage. We ask for revival. The lid has taken off this church, permission for God to show up in ways that we cannot imagine. Healing, signs, wonders, grace is marked by everything that God wants. Wisdom in this new season, a new season of abundant life, hope, and a joy that is contagious. Ha, 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 ha. Some of you need to tell your face to smile. A joy that is contagious. I, I'm shocked how many times people say, how are you today? You know, I go up to pay for something or, or whatever, and I say, live in the dream. And all of a sudden, they look at me, and there's a brightness comes to their face. Because, and they'll look at me and say, well, I haven't heard that ever. <laughs> because those kind of things are contagious. Hey, come on, amen. amen. Your amens are contagious too, all right? few of you will do it, it'll catch on. But he goes on, the words go on, encounter, encounter, encounter. That's what we're here for. We're believing that you have an encounter with Jesus today. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't care what you think about our worship, about my sermon, about how I'm dressed or how the building looks. I care that you have an encounter with him. I told people this church a long time ago, stop coming to church. Stop coming to church and believe God that you're walking into an encounter with a living God. And just say, I, I, won't, I won't even attend a church if I'm not walking into an encounter with a living God. He's here. Dreams and visions at night, angelic visitation, prophetic words, declarations, release of the supernatural. A season of supernatural involvement. Amplification, increase, strength, grace to run, a season of great increase. Revival, that is earth. Okay, got to get this, man. I, I hope you're ready to shout. And if you're not ready to shout, get your faith going because I want you to shout about this. Revival, that is earth shaking, earthquaking, rearranging, expansion and connection. God, come on, God is up to something, something stirring, something shaking, something's quaking, rearranging. Revival is here. Come on, give a shout to the Lord. Give a shout, come on, give a shout to the Lord. Thank you, God. Revival is here. Revival is here. I'm no longer praying for revival. I'm not asking for it. I'm believing that we are in the, we are in the beginning stages. We are at the threshold. All we got to do is step in it. Step in it. Those waters would have never parted had they not put their foot in the water. If they had not put their foot in the water, that water, that water would have stayed right where it was. But because they took that step, the waters began to part. 
I want to take that step. I want the waters to part. I want to, I want to walk in the revival that God has planned for this day. I'm walking in it. I'm walking in it. Come on, how many, how many people want to walk in it? How many people are with me? Come on, are you with me? Oh, my. Haggai chapter 2 says this. It says, the latter glory of this house. Listen, I, I, you know, there, there's context to Haggai chapter 2. I understand that. But I'm going to say that right now about this house. The glory, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of armies. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord. Do it again, God. Do it again, God. Because listen, you know what that says? The glory of the latter house will be increased over the former house. He's not just going to do it again. He's going to do it again and then some. I'll take the then some. How about you? Come on, will you? Thank God. Thank God. Uh, uh, last week, part one. Oh, my Lord. Nathan, man. It's like, boom, it's gone. It is a home run, man. It just stirred me up so much. Oh, I got so excited. I got convicted. I was in tears. I, I was just, I was so blessed. What a great message. What a great move of God. The kids, they just blessed my life. I, I just got happy about being a pastor of a church like this again. And boy, did I need it. I needed that. Because sometimes y'all are miserable. I just needed to, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But he talked about this. He said there are three typical things that lead into revival. If you study revivals over the years, especially over the last several hundred years, you study those revivals. He talked about desperate circumstances. And I look at desperate circumstances, I sum them up as this. War, famine, moral decline, economic devastation. We're in the right place. Come on. We are positioned for revival just based on desperate circumstances. We've got all of those things working uh, right now. And, and then he said this, number two, was raising up and calling out the hungry, people that are hungry. He, he said this, a hunger that is so intense that it changes your focus and changes your activities. You know, there, there are things that I used to love to do, and I really don't even like doing them anymore. Yeah, and, and let me give you a for instance. I, I was teaching in Oklahoma a couple of weeks ago down at the Bible school. And, and you know, I called up uh, the national director, and uh, we're friends, and I said, hey, let's go see a movie. He goes, yeah, I'm up for it. Let's go see a movie. So I had a free night, which most of my nights were free, but I, I, we went to this movie. And... I'll tell you, it, it was a really long movie. Now a lot of you know which, which movie we went and saw. It's no, no secret. It was Batman. I just want everybody to know, if you could find pictures, you would be amazed. I was Batman when I was a kid. I was. I had the cape. I had the mask. I had the shirt. I had the tights. I did. And if a picture of that ever surfaces, <laughs> I will burn it. <laughs> My, my friend was Robin, although today he'll, he'll say, I was not Robin, I was Batman. Yeah, you always wanted to be the leader. I was Batman, he was Robin. We'd climb trees, we'd jump from trees, we'd, we'd do all kinds of crazy stuff, swing from ropes. So anyway, we went and saw Batman, and I gotta tell you, you know, I'm not real good at staying awake during movies anyway, but, but this, it just bored me. I'm sorry, if you love that Batman movie, yeah, I was just bored. It was okay, it was nice, but all of a sudden, I just realized over the last several years, I am less entertained by what used to entertain me. I, I sit there and I, 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 like, I like it when things blow up. I like it when there's lots of noise. I like it, a movie that has guns and intrigue and all that kind of stuff. I love that kind of stuff. But nowadays, I sit and watch and I go, I'd rather be doing something else. I don't have a hunger for what I used to have a hunger for. Uh, there, there's, there's something that's changed. It's changed my focus. It's changed uh, my activities. And, and I don't know if you're feeling that, but all of a sudden it's like, I don't want to do some of those things. 
I, I just want to press in. I want to know you more, God. I want to know what you're all about, God. I want you, God. It doesn't mean it's a problem if you like to watch movies. I'm not saying that. This is for me. But number two was raising up, calling out the hungry. Number three was expect, expectant prayer. Expectant prayer. People that pray and truly expect that God's going to answer the prayers. Yes. Come on, amen. And he talked about the guy that he said, uh, kneel down on the floor, draw a circle around you in chalk, and then just begin to cry out to God, God, send revival into this circle. And listen, it's not all about us, but... If I am not revived, I can't bring revival anywhere else. If I am not awakened, I cannot be part of the great awakening. I've got to wake up. I've got to be revived. I only can take what is in me. I can't take. God, the Holy Ghost doesn't fall on fake. Doesn't fall on fake. Come on. Come on. He wants to do something. Amen? amen. Come on. Big amen. Come on. Amen. Say, do it again. Amen. Say, do it again. Amen. So during the Azusa Street revival, 19, uh, oh, whatever, 1906 to 1915, right, right around there. You know, it's funny because the Welsh revival only lasted about a year. And, and it's kind of like, wait a minute, so much happened in a year? In one year, in one year, the impact of the Welsh revival was so profound that the church, the, one of the main churches that it broke out in, for the next 20 years, the church was packed overflowing, people coming in and receiving from God. The revival itself only lasted a year, but the impact of the revival went on. It swept into North America, swept into India, swept into uh, parts of Asia, throughout Britain, many other parts of Europe. It's, in one year, the impact spread around the world. It was an amazing thing. So, so here's two uh, principles of, of the Azusa Street Revival. You've got William Seymour and you've got Frank Bartleman. Uh, William Seymour and Frank Bartleman, as, as they pressed in to know God, you know, this revival is going on and there's all this crazy stuff going on and people are coming from around the world, which was not easy to do in that day. They're coming from around the world to find out what this, uh, this, this whole revival was. As the revival moved on, Frank Bartleman and others, but Frank had this word of prophecy, something God showed him about the end time revival that would hit the United States of America and sweep around the world. I, how many of you want to know about the end time revival? And some people say, well, I don't even believe we're in the end times. You believe whatever you want. I don't care. All I know is we're closer to it than when I was a kid. And I actually believe the signs of the times are showing that we are very, 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 very close. Very close. Now, what comes after that? I don't know. A lot of debate. Don't care. I just want to be there. I just want to see it. I want to be a part of whatever God does. Amen? So, so there would be this end time revival and Frank Bartleman began to prophesy and, and he prophesied about that end time revival and it was actually a cautionary prophecy. Because he said, in that end time revival, there would be certain things that would be marking the church, and he was giving it as a caution, really a warning for the end time church. Now, I do believe, based on this warning, it is speaking about the church today. Let me tell you what it was. It's three-pronged. Number one, he said, there, and they'll all be up on the screen, there would be an overemphasis on power versus righteousness. There would be an overemphasis on the gifts of the Spirit versus the Lordship of Christ. There would be an overemphasis on worship of a God that we no longer talk to. Those are the words that he had for the, the church, and I believe it is for the church today because I see these things. I've watched, I've watched people that will worship at the altar of the power of God, yet they're living uh, uh, lives that y you just are embarrassed to talk about. The righteousness that, that they've been made to be is not being walked out in their everyday life. And we all make mistakes. Don't get me wrong. 
But, but listen, we were made the righteousness of God in Christ. He is the sanctifier. He set us apart. I'm sanctified. I've been made righteous. I need to walk it out. I can't worship at the altar of the power of God and want the power of God and live any way I want to live. Think any way I want to think. You can't do that. You can't. You can't expect that sin and the Holy Ghost are going to coexist in our lives or in our churches. You can't expect that. We all make mistakes. We all sin. We all, we all do that. We miss the mark. But we have got to clean it up, people. We got to clean it up. Amen. And you don't clean them up. You clean you up. Boy, aren't we good at recognizing the sin in other people's lives? Wow, but enough about politics. <laughs> Overemphasize on the gifts of the Spirit versus the Lordship of Christ. Frank Bartleman said this, he warned of what he called a Christless Pentecost. A Christless Pentecost. Here's what he said, he said, Jesus could actually become a stranger in the midst of our spirit-filled congregation. I, I thank God for the emphasis on Jesus in this church. I, I do. I, I'm grateful for that because it really is all about him. It's all about him. If it's not about him, then we ought to just close our doors and go do something else. Come on, amen? And then overemphasis on the worship of a God that we no longer talk to. We become so busy doing things for him, we're no longer truly connected with him. And that's, that's not what he wants in his church. That's not the kind of relationship that's going to birth the, the earth-changing revival that he expects us to walk in. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. Clara Barton, many of you may know that name. She was the uh, founder of the American Red Cross. Uh, she was a Civil War nurse, and she said this. She said, we do a disservice to those we lead when we paint a picture of what we can accomplish before we establish the type of person that we need to be. <sighs> Power will get people's attention, but character will sustain it. The, the power of God is a wonderful thing. Uh, uh, you know, having a great church, that's a wonderful thing. But how are you going to sustain the move of God? How are you going to sustain it? You've got you to be living right. You've got to have the right character, amen? I don't know about you, but I want to live ready rather than when God begins to move, have to get ready. I want to live ready, amen? We need to live ready. We need to live ready. So I want to revisit one of the elements from last week that leads to revival. I want to talk a little bit more about that hunger thing. So, so just stick with me for a little bit because I believe that heaven responds to and loves hunger. The Bible talks many times, says, listen, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. It's one of the, it's one of the be attitudes that Jesus talked about. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Uh, we need to, we need to uh, desire the sincere milk of the word so that we can grow. It speaks a lot about hunger. I, I don't know if you've noticed, but whatever you're hungry for, you sort of become obsessed with. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, Pastor Nate last week, it was just not right that he spent so much time telling us about Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> I, I know some of you, you left here and you went to find if that sign was on. There's only a, I think there's only a couple of them around here. One's on 14 Mile, just the other side of John R. Uh, one is at uh, Shaner, uh, just north of Hull Road. I never go to those, but I never, I never go there. No, it's been, <laughs> it's been ages since I've had, it really has. It's been a long time since I've had one. But man, we, oh man. Seriously, they are just ungodly good. When they're hot, man, it's like eating cotton candy, isn't it? It's, it's like it just melts in your mouth, and you got that sugary sweetness with that little bit of grease. It's just, it's just, am I helping anybody? Am I helping your obsessions? But see, isn't that true? That the things we begin to hunger after, we become obsessed with. I don't know about you, but I love a, a pecan cluster blizzard. 
from Dairy Queen. It's just the best. You know what else I love? I love a fresh cooked, perfectly grilled steak, hot off the grill, a little bit of Kansas uh, City Steakhouse uh, seasoning that's been rubbed on top as it's cooked slowly. And you cut into it and it's just this uh, juicy, uh, uh, medium rare to medium pinkness in the middle. I, I mean, don't you just... Anybody hungry? Am I helping anybody? No. no, I'm not helping you, right? Okay, now bring it, bring it in, bring it in. Come on, listen to the message now, okay? <laughs> but, but isn't that true? Whatever, whatever you become hungry for, somebody says, barbecue chicken pizza from Jets. Oh, come on, I got you now, I got you now. And, and all of a sudden you become, I gotta have it, I want some. Am I right? Whatever you get hungry for, you'll get obsessed with. And I want to be hungry for the right things. It's not wrong to be hungry for some of those earthly, worldly things. It's not necessarily wrong, but what are you really hungry for? I'm hungry for God. I'm hungry for a move of God, for the revival that he wants. I have a hunger for that. Uh, we, we learned last week, William Seymour of Azusa Street, he said this, he said, such a hunger to have more of God was in my heart that I prayed five hours a day for two and a half years. And then he was frustrated because nothing was happening. He said, God, what do I do? He said, pray more. Listen, if I'm praying, if I'm praying for five hours a day and I go to God and I said, what should I do? And he tells me to pray more. I'm going to say, is there another opinion up there? <laughs> I mean, Seriously. So what did he do? He added two or two and a half hours to his prayer time and just kept praying and, and, and we see what God did. But he didn't pray for revival. He prayed to know God. See, there are certain things that are byproducts of the real thing. Well, I think a byproduct is a, I, I think a, a revival is a byproduct of us being hungry for God. I, I just believe that. I believe we'll grow more and more in that revival as we become, as a church, more and more hungry uh, for him. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, Joy, Joy and I, well, I started watching it, but then I, I had lots of evenings I couldn't do it, so uh, we started watching this show that some of you are familiar with. I'm sure maybe you've watched it a long time ago, but it's called This Is Us. Anybody ever watch This Is Us? Dear Lord, if you, like, if, if you don't cry... If you don't cry, you got a stone for a heart. I mean, man, I, some of those episodes, oh my Lord, they just rip your heart out. So, so Joy, Joy watches a lot more than I'm able to, and every once in a while I'll sit in there and I'll just kind of watch whatever episode she's on, and, and you know, and you, you sort of get caught up. And I don't know if you know how that goes. There are lots of flashbacks, you know, all this flashback stuff in that show. Well, the other day I went and sat down, and she was in an episode, and and here's the scene that I watched. The son is in his house, dad's sitting in a recliner watching TV, mom's in the kitchen making a sandwich. She brings the sandwich in on a plate, sets it down in front of her husband, and all of a sudden he's, he's, he just shouts some you know, craziness about the sandwich, doesn't like it, throws it on the floor, says, make me another one woman or some, something like that. Go make me another sandwich. And the son's just sitting there. He's just come back from the war not long before. And, and he's just sitting there going, Mom, pack your bags. Pack your bags. You don't have to put up with this. You don't have to put up with this anymore. Now listen, uh, whatever your opinion is of that moment, I'm just saying, uh, sometimes we've put up with things for so long, it becomes okay. Okay. That's not okay. That's not okay. And the fact that we've put up without a move of God for so long, it's not okay. The way, the way we put up with, uh, with just kind of doing church and riding the carousel, a beautiful thing going in circles, it's not okay. It's not okay. And we've got to get that hunger saying it's not okay. I have got to have everything that you intend for me to have, God. It's what I have to have. Amen? History is very clear about this. 
that revival, revival has never broken out among the passive. The Bible is not a, po- a, a book of passivity. Well, I'm just a pacifist. Well, then you're not going to like the Bible at all. You're not going to like the Bible because the Bible is not a book for passive people. It's not. So, well, Jesus was passive. Oh, you've not read about the Jesus I know. He told religion what for. I mean, if you're standing in front of the religious leaders and said, you're just whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. How dare you talk to me like that? How dare I? I'm Jesus. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) Just because you don't know who I am, that's just what I do. He's looking for a church that's hungry. But, but let me, let me I, I just want to throw something out here. I don't even know if I'll get to the rest of what I want to say, because probably not. Many in this church are hungry. That's a good thing. Many in this church are hungry. Many that used to go to this church said they were hungry. I have said that I'm hungry. I've declared it today. But there's one thing that will derail our pursuit of what we say we're hungry for. Jesus talked about it in a conversation in Mark chapter 2. And he said this in verse 22. He said, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. Now you're looking at me like, I don't even understand what that means. Neither do I, so we're even. No, I have an inkling what it means. There's not one revival that you can study in all of human history that looked like the culture that it was birthed in. There's not one move of God, not one revival, whether it was some of the modern day revivals in Toronto or in Pensacola or, 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 or Azusa Street, or all. there's not one revival that when it was birthed, it looked like the culture of where it was birthed. It changed everything. It caused people to go tilt. It was like, I, I don't even know. I want revival, I want revival, I'm hungry for you, God. I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't like that. That's not comfortable. I don't like how we do that anymore. And all of a sudden, they wanted to take the new wine and put it in their old wineskins. And you're not going to get the revival that he wants for you if you're hanging on to the old wineskin. Not going to happen. They'll both be destroyed. The new wine will fall out on the floor and be wasted. And your wineskin that you thought you wanted, will be ruined. I'll tell you what, pastoring this church, I've watched that over the last couple of years. See, God only knows how many revivals have been aborted because it was pouring new wine, but we insisted that it be stored and contained in an old wineskin. What does the old wineskin look like? The old wineskin in a church like this would look like a worship team that comes ready with three songs in their set because we sing one fast song, then we do two slow songs because that's praise, this is worship, and we're going to get through our set and we're not going to do anything else but that set because that's what we practice. And if anybody asks us to go beyond that, uh, we're going to be in trouble because we can go beyond that because that's all we know to do. That's old wineskin, my friend. And I, and I want to tell you something. The way our worship team goes, I mean, what did, what, what did they do today? I, I don't even know. They were singing stuff. Well, I didn't even know those songs. They didn't even know those songs. 
They didn't know, they didn't know God was going to take them down that road. Jonathan didn't know those songs he was going to do. He didn't know what he was going to do. Ivy didn't know what she was going to say. It just started coming up out of their spirits. You go, I don't even know if I like singing like that. It goes on so long and I don't even know what to do. Press in, get in, jump in the water. Jump in the water, come on. Stop, stop, trying to, stop trying to accept the new wine, putting it in your old wineskin of your mindset. It's, your, it's our mindset that will keep us from moving in the direction of what God wants to do and we can't afford that. So some of our some of our wine skins are uh, the old wine skins are. Listen, I want how many want revival? Come on, come on. How many want revival? Woo, I want revival. I want revival, Pastor. Uh, these services go kind of long, but I want revival. Give me revival. Just let us out of here before one o'clock. In fact, one o'clock. What are we talking to? Two hour service? What are we? What? 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 And, oh, and it's got to be on a Sunday. It's got to be Sunday morning. That's the only day I can do revival. <laughs> and dear Lord, what are those people doing up front? Kind of distracting. And, and what's, what's the deal with the flags? Flags, flags, what are the flags for? And who's that guy that's got that crazy little horn thing he blows? <laughs> Who is that? Who is that? Looks like he cut it off some animal. What's that animal? There's, there's some animal running around with one horn. I mean, what, the poor animal. What's going on? And he blows it. It's, it's like one note. It's like, what is that all about? I don't think I like that. I go find a church where they don't do that. Oh, they're everywhere. Trust me. They're everywhere. You won't have a hard time finding that. And dear Jesus, why did we have to change the mission statement? Listen, I wasn't really happy about that either, to be honest. <laughs> I like the old mission statement. And why no Saturday service? And, and, and listen, I've, we've had people, they don't, they, don't like our new, they don't like our new wine. They don't want to change their wine skin because our white is way too white. Listen, <laughs> I'm pretty white, okay? I, I can dance just a little bit, but I, I, I can keep a beat pretty good. I can sing okay. I, I, I can dress kind of nice. I'm still white. Still real. I try to tan it up a little bit now and then, but I'm white. I've had people tell me, your white at that church is too white and your black is not black enough. I'm telling you, I've been told that. I'm just like, Are, uh, you've lost your mind. You've lost your mind. You are so completely out of touch with what God is doing. You've lost your mind. Please. Anyway, have I said enough to cause everybody to... Oh, no, one more thing. <laughs> and I can't believe that this church doesn't allow Pastor Jerry to preach more. <laughs> Some of you are not thinking that. <laughs> In fact, you're kind of, some of you have never thought that, and you're kind of like, oh, we like it when other people speak a lot more. No, listen, I've had people, listen, we want one dominant voice preaching in our church, and if we can't have that, we'll find a church. That, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. God bless you. And I pastored this church that way for years, decades. But I want to tell you, I'm pressing into the gifts. I'm pressing into the, 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 the ministry gifts. Because you know what? I need to hear from the prophet. I need to hear from the apostle. I need to hear from the evangelist and the teacher. I need to hear, so do you. So do you. You may not even know it, but you, you need to hear that. How many revivals have been aborted because we insisted on our old wineskins? And he began to pour out the new wine and pour it out and pour it out. And we're trying to gather it up, put in the wineskin. It won't fit. It won't last. It won't stay there. It'll burst and be ruined. We got to say, God, give me the new wineskin. I will be that new wineskin. Pour out your spirit. Pour out your new wine. I want whatever you got. And if I got to change, I will change. Because I want revival. I want revival. Amen? Amen? I want revival. Do you want revival? Yes. 
Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Okay, stand up. I, I didn't say I was done preaching. I just said stand up. <laughs> oh, no. It, listen, while I was preparing this, I believe Spirit of God spoke this to me. And listen, if he spoke it to me, I'm going to tell you. Because I think, I think he spoke it to me because you're the problem. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. He told me that in this move, he will assault my logic. He will assault my logic to bring me deeper into the spirit. That's, that's actually a scripture, by the way. Uh, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Stop trying to figure it all out. Don't lead in your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. He'll direct your path. So he will assault our logic. I, I think you want to do things in here where you go, what is going on at Grace? Why are they doing that? Well, listen, if God gets the glory and people get healed and people get set free and come on, the word is preached and we glorify him, then man, I'll, I'll, I'll pay the price. Will you? Will you? Do we have people that'll pay the price in this church? Maybe that's the clapping of those that'll be left. I don't know. <laughs> it's going to take a great deal of surrender. You don't have to put those slides up, media department, but it's going to take a great deal of surrender. Thinking about that last night, I thought, isn't that interesting? One of the words for worship that I, I enjoy all through the week. It's a word, uh, it's a Hebrew word, tahalah, and it literally is, there's a couple of things that it talks about, but part of it is the extending of the hands in worship, tahalah. Isn't it interesting that one of, the, one of the symbols, one of the ways we worship, we praise Jesus, is also an international symbol of surrender. Put up your hands. Surrender, surrender. Well, I wasn't really telling you all to do it, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But, but it is. It's, it's a symbol of surrender, isn't it? But it's also a symbol of worship. You can't worship him in fullness till you surrender to him. Right? You can't. The third thing I would have talked about had I had time was passionate prayer. He needs our hunger needs our surrender and I, be, I believe per, passionate prayer every revival in all of history had passionate prayer as a part of it every revival people didn't sit around twiddling their thumbs study the life of Father Nash Reverend Finney who was really the catalyst that God used behind the second great awakening. And yet there was this Episcopalian priest. Think about it. Episcopalian priest, Father Nash, who at 48 years old, quit preaching, quit everything that he was trained to do, and said, I will spend the rest of my life burning the embers of prayer, stoking the furnace of revival in prayer while people like Finney and others would preach. He just stayed in a room, sometimes so loud, they sent for the police to find out what was going on in that room. He was crying out with such anguish, just calling on God, so desperate for him to move in the meeting that he was praying for. I'm telling you. That's where this church is going. Amen?